Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased you could join us for today's program, whether you're here with us in the theater or joining us through our Facebook or YouTube channels. Before we hear from Judge Richard Gergel about his new book, I'd like to alert you to two other programs coming up soon in this theater. On Thursday, May 23rd at 7, Pamela Nadell will be here with her new book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. And on Tuesday, May 28th at 7 p.m., Henry Louis Gates Jr. will discuss Stony the Road, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, and the Rise of Jim Crow, his book about the struggle by African Americans for equality after the Civil War. Check our website at archives.gov or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports our education and outreach activities. Visit its website, archivesfoundation.org, to learn more about the foundation and join online. Countless stories lie within the billions of pages at the National Archives. Some of them personal, perhaps of interest only to family members, and some have reverberated across, across our society and had the power to change history. Sergeant I Isaac Woodard's story is in the second category. Documents in the Harry Truman Presidential Library and here previously undisclosed FBI and Department of Just Justice files helped our author retell that story. The responses to the appalling injustice of Woodard's beating and blinding led to the desegregation of the U.S. Armed Forces in the 1954 Brown School desegregation decision. In a review in the New York Times, David Blight writes, Gurgle's book is a revealing window into both the hideous racial violence and humiliation of segregation in the period immediately after World War II and the heroic origins of the legal crusade to destroy Jim Crow. In Unexampled Courage, Judge Gurgle relates stories of injustice and adds to our own knowledge of our civil rights movement in America. Richard Gurgle is a United States District Court judge who presides in the same courthouse in Charleston, South Carolina, where Judge Wadey's wearing one of the central figures of the book once served. A native of Columbia, South Carolina, Judge Gurgle earned undergraduate and law degrees from Duke University, go Duke. He was in practice, private practice in Columbia before being nominated to the federal bench by President Barack Obama in 2009. With his life, Belinda Gurgle, another Duke grad, he is the author of a previous book, In Pursuit of the Tree of Life, A History of the Early Jews of Columbia, South Carolina. Judge Gurgle and his work have been featured on PBS, NPR, in the New York Times, and the Washington Post, among other outlets. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Richard Gurgle. It is a pleasure to be here at the National Archives and to share the story of unexampled courage because here in Washington, important aspects of this story took place. Further, I'm honored to tell the story at the National Archives because the agency's diligent staff, both here in Washington and and that the Truman Presidential Library in Independence, Missouri played such a critical role in locating uh, documents that help document and tell this story. And for anyone who's done a great deal of research, uh, what you know is that you go and you make some general request to a highly skilled and devoted archivist about what you're looking for, and what you end up getting is suggestions, well, perhaps you need to think about this idea or that idea, or let me show you a document you may not know exists. And that is exactly what happened both with the National Archives staff in Washington as well as at the Truman Presidential Library. So I do, um, and I mentioned in, my, um, in the book itself, in my acknowledgments, and I say so again here today, Thank you for the uh, incredibly 
devoted and professional staff of the National Archives. Now let me now share with you the story of unexampled courage. As the clock struck 7 p.m. on August 14, 1945, President Harry Truman assembled the White House Press Corps in the Oval Office. The ebullient president standing behind his desk informed the reporters that earlier that afternoon, the Japanese government had surrendered, bringing an end at last to World War II. The reporters spontaneously burst into applause and then raced for the door to share this historic announcement with the rest of the world. Thousands gathered in Lafayette Square across from the White House to celebrate, and soon there were calls, we want Truman, we want Truman. The president went on to the north portico of the White House to deliver a few remarks. This is a great day for free governments in the world, Truman announced. This is the day that fascism and police government ceases in the world. The great task ahead is to restore peace and bring free government to the world. But beneath the veneer of America's grand self-image as the bastion of freedom and liberty was a stark reality. African Americans residing in the old Confederacy lived in a twilight world between slavery and freedom. They no longer had masters, but they did not enjoy the rights of a free people. Black Southerners were routinely denied the right to vote segregated physically from the dominant white society as a matter of law and relegated to the margins of American prosperity. Racial violence and lynchings festered just beneath the surface, ready to explode at any moment. And this image um, it was, uh, was called the lynching flag and it flew from the national headquarters of the NAACP in New York the morning after each lynching in America. And tragically, in the first half of the 20th century, this image was seen commonly in New York as the association um, hoisted the flag each morning after one of these tragic events. Black Americans living in other regions of the country outside the South had their own challenges. As the nearly 900,000 black veterans returned home after the end of World War II, they quickly realized that little had changed, and they began demanding their rightful place in America's free government. Seen from today's perspective, the American triumph over Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement might seem to have been inevitable. The collapse of morally indefensible practices wholly inconsistent with the United States Constitution. But in 1945, with black Southerners almost entirely disenfranchised, white-dominated Southern state governments resolutely committed to the racial status quo, and the federal government largely a passive bystander. There was no obvious path to resolving this great American dilemma. Something had to be done, but what and by whom? My book, Unexampled Courage, details the long overlooked story of the beating and blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, a battlefield decorated African American soldier by the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina on the day of his discharge from the military and while still in his dress uniform and the transformative impact of this incident on President Harry S. Truman and United States District Judge Jay Waitis Waring of Charleston, South Carolina. Horrified and inspired by the injustice of this brutal event, President Truman would launch a civil rights program culminating in the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. And Judge Waring would issue landmark civil rights decisions, including his great 1951 dissent in Briggs v. Elliott that would become the model for Brown versus Board of Education just three years later. Late in the afternoon of February 12, 1946, Isaac Woodard boarded a Greyhound bus in Augusta, Georgia, after discharge hours earlier from nearby Camp Gordon, and was traveling to Columbia, South Carolina, the capital of South Carolina, and then to his hometown of Winsboro, 
where he was to rendezvous with his wife after several years of separation. During one of the frequent stops along the way, Woodard approached a white bus driver, the white bus driver, and asked if he could step off the bus to relieve himself. At the time, interstate buses did not have restrooms, and Greyhound drivers were instructed to accommodate such requests. Instead, the bus driver cursed Woodard, telling him, I ain't got time to wait, and ordered him to return to his seat at the back of the bus. To the apparent astonishment of the bus driver, Woodard cursed him back and stated, talk to me like I'm talking to you. I am a man just like you. The stunned bus driver told Woodard to go ahead, but at the next stop in Batesburg, South Carolina, the bus driver, now no longer concerned with staying on schedule, departed his bus in search of a police officer to have Woodard removed from the bus and arrested. Woodard soon found himself confronted by the police chief of Batesburg, Linwood Shaw, who responded to Woodard's efforts to explain himself by striking him over the head with his blackjack and escorting Woodard off to the town jail. On the way, Woodard was repeatedly beaten with Shaw's blackjack, ultimately driving the end of the baton into both of Woodard's eyes. The sergeant was then thrown in a semi-conscious state into the town jail for the night. When he awoke the next morning, he realized he could not see. Later that morning, Woodard was taken to the town court and convicted of drunk and disorderly conduct. Accounts of Woodard's beating and blinding were reported in the black press and received nationwide attention when Orson Welles focused on the incident in his weekly radio program on ABC Radio. Mass meetings were organized in black communities across the nation to protest Sergeant Woodard's treatment. And a benefit concert for, for Woodard in New York City, headed by Joe Lewis and featuring such luminaries as Count Basie, Cab Calloway, and Nat King Cole, played to a sold out audience of 23,000. And in this image, obviously Sergeant Woodard is in the center and to, his, and to our left looking at the picture, uh, is Joe Lewis, then the reigning heavyweight champion of the world. Meanwhile, other black veterans returning to their homes in the rural South confronted other incidents of racial violence, including racially inspired murders. No state prosecuted those involved in any of these incidents. On September 19, 1946, a delegation of civil rights leaders met with President Truman in the White House, deeply distressed by this wave of racial violence. Prior to the meeting, Truman staff advised him that despite his desire to respond to the concerns of civil rights leaders, there was little he could do as president to address these incidents. Criminal prosecutions by the federal government for civil rights violations in the South were fraught with problems. Most notably, all white juries deeply unsympathetic to civil rights cases. And of course, the reason the juries were all white is that jury, jury lists were drawn from voter lists and African Americans were routinely disenfranchised in all of the southern states. Because jury lists were drawn uh, further, Congress was under the control of powerful southern committee chairs who were determined to block even the most modest civil rights legislation, including making lynching a federal crime. At the meeting, as the meeting opened, civil rights leaders urged the president to call Congress back into session to address the spreading violence against African American veterans. The president expressed sympathy but lamented there was little he could do because the lack of public support for new civil rights legislation. Leading the group was Walter White. Now, in looking at in, in our image here, he would be the gentleman uh, to our right to the right of President Truman, to, of course, to President Truman's left. Um, Walter White had been the head of the NAACP, the, the executive secretary, for um, over a decade. He was the most important civil rights leader uh, in the country. And for, for political purposes, for Truman, Truman's most important supporter in the civil rights community. It was a, imp apparent to Mr. White that the president did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. 
White changed the discussion by sharing with President Truman in detail the blinding of Isaac Woodard. As the tragic story unfolded, Truman sat riveted and became visibly agitated with the idea that a uniformed and decorated American soldier had been so cruelly treated. Abandoning the advice of his staff, Truman stated, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. We have got to do something. The following day, Truman wrote his attorney general, Tom Clark, and shared with him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard, noting that the police officer had deliberately put out Isaac Woodard's eyes. Truman made it clear that the time for federal action had now arrived. He further indicated he intended to appoint the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights to propose a new agenda to address America's serious racial problems. Three business days after Truman's letter was delivered to the Attorney General, the Department of Justice announced the prosecution of Batesburg Police Chief Lynn Woodshull for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice prepared the necessary documents to organize the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights. Truman charged his committee in his first meeting on January 15, 1947 to be bold and to attack the root causes of America's deep-seated racial problems. He held the committee's first meeting in the cabinet room to emphasize the importance of its work. In less than a year, the Truman Civil Rights Committee issued a landmark report to secure these rights, which graphically detailed America's profound racial challenges and proposed groundbreaking policies and legislation, including the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. Truman embraced publicly the proposals of his Civil Rights Committee, and on July 26, 1948, in the midst of his reelection campaign, he issued Executive Order 9981, mandating the integration of America's armed forces. And I will note here, this is a, um, a um, article, a headline in an African-American newspaper, Chicago Defender, of course, highlighting that President Truman wipes out segregation and armed forces. My son, seeing this presentation, notices, Dad, look at the headline right below it. Posse bent on lynching searches woods for prey. This was America, tragically, in 1948. The successful desegregation of the military, which Truman implemented before he left office, marked the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America. The Justice Department's efforts to prosecute Linwood Shull in the Federal District Court in Columbia, South Carolina, produced in the short term a predictable result. An all-white, all-male jury acquitted the police chief after only 28 minutes of deliberations. The case was tried before United States District Judge Jay Waitis Waring, a Charleston patrician whose father was a Confederate veteran and multiple generations of ancestors were slaveholders. Prior to the trial, Judge Waring was personally skeptical about the federal government's prosecution of a local police officer, but his views changed when he heard the highly credible testimony of the blinded sergeant who described his arrest and vicious beating at the hands of Chief Shull. As Shull supporters cheered his acquittal, few noticed that Judge Waring's wife, Elizabeth, who had attended the trial, left the courtroom in tears. Judge Waring joined his wife later that evening, and both were traumatized by the trial over which he had just presided. The Shull trial forced the judge and his wife to stare directly into the southern racial abyss, a view which would forever transform both of them. Waring later described the Shull trial as his personal baptism of fire and his Michigan-born wife's baptism in racial prejudice. The Warings returned home after the Shull trial, resolved to learn more about issues of race and justice, which the Warings had previously thought little about. These were not subjects which could be openly discussed among, in the white, among white Charlestonians of that era. 
the Warings decided to undertake their own self-directed study. Each evening after dinner, Elizabeth would read a portion of a selected work to allow the judge to rest his eyes after a day of handling his judicial duties. The couple would then discuss what they had read, often while driving around Charleston in the evening, a favorite pastime. Many have asked me, well, what did they read? And what they read were books that many of you may have remembered from your uh, college study days. Um, uh, W.J. Cash, Mind of the South, uh, Gunnar Murdahl, The American Dilemma. The American Dilemma was a study um, funded by the Carnegie for Foundation immediately after World War II to make an in-depth, candid assessment of the uh, uh, racial problems of the United States. And Swedish economist and social scientist Gunnar Myrdal was selected to, um, to, to uh, head the study. Over 40 um, um, uh, scholars participated in the study, including Ralph Bunch and Dr. Kenneth Clark. Um, the book was 1,400 pages long. It is an amazing document. And after the, where, the, the Elizabeth and uh, Waitus Waring had read night after night the 1,400 pages, for them, there was no turning back. As Judge Waring's new views on race and justice emerged, George Elmore, a black businessman, filed suit in the Federal District Court in Columbia in 1947, challenging the South Carolina Democratic Party's all-white primary. Elmore was represented by Thurgood Marshall, the 39-year-old chief counsel of the NAACP, who was already developing a re reputation of almost legendary proportions as a skilled litiga litigator and legal strategist. South Carolina political leaders were united in their determination to preserve the white primary, notwithstanding clear United States Supreme Court precedent holding such white primaries unconstitutional. Waring understood that any decision recognizing the right of minority citizens to vote would produce um, in, an intensely hostile and possibly violent, a violent public reaction. But Waring concluded that his choice was either, quote, to be entirely governed by the doctrine of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. He went to his wife and he told her, Elizabeth, we are about if I rule the way I believe I need to rule, our lives will never be the same. And she, by this point, a convert herself to the issues of race and justice, says, I'm with you from start to finish. On July 12, 1947, Judge Waring issued his decision in Elmore v. Rice, declaring the white primary unconstitutional. Waring ended his order by declaring, it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the union and to adopt the American way of conducting elections. The groundbreaking nature of the Elmore decision was immediately appreciated by the leadership of the NAACP. In a private note to Thurgood Marshall, William Hasty, who would later become the first black federal judge in American history, stated, I have read the South Carolina opinion three times and I still don't believe it. In many respects, I think it is your greatest legal achievement. But the segregationists would not give up. Soon a new party rule was adopted, allowing blacks to vote in the party primary so long as they would pledge their support to racial segregation. A new suit was filed, and on July 16, 1948, Judge Waring summoned all 93 members of the South Carolina Democratic Party's executive committee to his Charleston courtroom for an emergency hearing. Waring denounced their efforts to defy his earlier ruling in Elmore and explained that a federal judge faced with contempt could impose a fine or a jail term. He wanted those present to know if there were any future violations of his order, there would be no fines. Thereafter, African Americans by the thousands began to register to vote in South Carolina. The response of South Carolina's white uh, supremacists was thunderous. Death threats written and oral were constant. A cross was burned at the Waring's residence and bricks were thrown through their living room window. 
At no time in American history had a federal judge faced such violent public reaction. Time magazine described Judge Waring as the man they loved to hate, but also noted that he was proving to be a person of cool courage. If the purpose of the unprecedented vilification of Waring was intended to cower him, it did not work. Instead, he continued his study and reflection on race and justice in America and became convinced that the foundation of Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court's 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, was legally, historically, and morally wrong. Wearing then approaching 70 years of age and likely retirement, resolved to play a role in overturning the separate but equal doctrine. Waring developed a plan to place a school desegregation case onto the docket of the United States Supreme Court, firmly convinced that a majority of justices would overturn Plessy if they directly confronted the issue. He noted on his trial docket a case from Clarendon County, South Carolina, Briggs v. Elliott, which sought to equalize the facilities in the district's profoundly unequal black and white schools this was a classic Plessy v. Ferguson claim. When the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, appeared at the Charleston Courthouse on November 17, 1950, for a pretrial conference for his case to begin in just a few days, he was advised that the judge wished to see him in his office. I'm sure Mr. Marshall thought, what have I done? After being ushered into the judge's office, Waring told Marshall, he, didn't, he said, told him, I don't want to try another separate but equal case. Bring me a frontal attack on segregation. Marshall responded, this is on our agenda, judge. It's just not tonight. We don't think this is the case. We don't think this is the time. Judge Waring responded, telling Marshall, this is the case. This is the time. Marshall urged the judge to think practically, noting that any decision by him overturning Plessy would be reversed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia. Waring explained that since a challenge to public school segregation contested the constitutionality of a state law, he would request an appointment of a three-judge panel in which he would sit. This would bypass an appeal to the Fourth Circuit. Marshall responded that the plaintiffs would lose two to one. Waring agreed, but noted that any appeal from a three-judge panel went directly to the United States Supreme Court. And he says, Thurgood, that's where you want to be. Waring's plan was bold, even brilliant, but conflicted with the highly successful litigation strategy of the NAACP they carefully built one legal precedent on top of another, never trying to get ahead of the Supreme Court. A few minutes after this dramatic encounter, Waring convened the pretrial conference in Briggs and publicly pressed Marshall on whether he was prepared to challenge the constitutionality of public school segregation. Marshall stated that he was and agreed to dismiss his pending lawsuit and refile Briggs as the first frontal attack on public school segregation in American history. Although Marshall agreed to dismiss his original complaint, he needed to obtain the consent of his clients on, on, regarding this new legal strategy. Marshall had a real concern about the safety of his clients if they took such a bold step in their rural and impoverished community. And he sent his top assistant, Robert Carter, who would later be a United States District Judge, to Somerton to discuss this change in legal strategy. Carter told a large crowd assembled at St. Mark's Church in Somerton that those agreeing to join the new suit could expect to lose their jobs and suffer other forms of retaliation. Carter told them there was no shame or embarrassment if the plaintiffs felt they could not participate further but the NAACP felt that the time had come to, to confront segregation head on. An elderly gentleman at the back of the, of the church rose and stated, quote, 
We were wondering how long it would take you lawyers to figure this out, end quote. With only two exceptions, all of the original Briggs plaintiffs chose to join the new suit. The newly filed Briggs case was tried in the Charleston Federal Courthouse in May 1951 before a three-judge panel, which included Judge Waring. In prior years, civil rights cases in the South were sparsely attended by members of the black community, lest they be identified as members of the NAACP or challengers to the racial status quo. But on the morning of May 28, 1951, as the sun rose in Charleston, African Americans lined up at the federal courthouse and down Broad Street as far as the eye could see, hoping to observe what many thought might be the most important case in American history. Judge Waring observed the massive crowd from his office window, later describing the scene as a breath of freedom. My dear friend Jonathan Green, a noted South Carolina artist, has painted this scene, which, um, which depicts the opening day of the trial of Briggs v. Elliott. And if you notice in a window, you'll see Judge Waring staring out into the crowd. Those in attendance in the courtroom were not disappointed by the performance of Thurgood Marshall and his trial team. The trial included the testimony of Dr. Kenneth Clark, a social psychologist who had done groundbreaking research on the effects of segregation on black children using black and white dolls. The crowd was also entertained by Marshall's devastating cross-examination of the state's key witness, who was ironically named Crow. Many joked that Thurgood Marshall, quote, sure loves to eat crow, and one observer referencing the state's renowned attorney, Bob Figg, stated, Mr. Figg got his law degree when he finished school, but he just got his baccalaureate address from Thurgood Marshall. As Waring predicted, the majority of the panel ruled that South Carolina's laws mandating segregated schools were lawful under the Plessy Doctrine. But Waring, fully aware he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant and brilliant attack on the foundations of segregation in America. He concluded by finding Segregation and education can never produce equality, and it is an evil that must be eradicated. Segregation and education adopted and practiced in the state of South Carolina must go and go now. Segregation is per se inequality, written in June 1951. Waring also praised the Briggs plaintiffs, who he was fully aware had suffered severe retaliation for their participation in the case, noting, quote, they have shown unexampled courage in bringing and presenting this cause in the face of the long-established and age-old way of life which the state of South Carolina has adopted and practiced and lived in since and as a result of the institution of human slavery. Waring's dissent was the first challenge to public school segregation by a federal judge in the 55 years since Plessy. Some have asked how Judge Waring, a United States District Judge, could presume to overrule existing United States Supreme Court precedent in Plessy v. Ferguson. Judge Waring did not believe that he was doing that. The year prior to his great dissent, the Supreme Court decided three important civil rights cases, one involving a separate but not equal law school uh, in Texas, that title of that case was Sweat v. Painter. Another involved a graduate student at the University of Oklahoma, George McLaren, who was allowed to enter the school but required to sit outside the classroom. And that image was in the record in the, um, in the United States Supreme Court. And the third involving a challenge to segregated dining cars on interstate trains, Henderson versus the United States. In all three of those cases, the plaintiffs won in unanimous decisions. Some commentators asserted that these civil rights cases, these civil rights victories, represented a further whittling away of the Plessy Doctrine. But Judge Waring, reading these decisions together, concluded that they stood for the proposition that separate could never be equal. Waring viewed his dissent as stating explicitly what he believed the Supreme Court had already ruled implicitly. In early 1952, 
some six months after the Great Descent, Waring announced his retirement as a federal judge and moved to New York City, exhausted by his isolation and ostracism in his home community of Charleston. Waring followed closely later school desegregation cases from Virginia, Delaware, and Kansas, all which were consolidated before the United States Supreme Court with Briggs under the name Brown versus Board of Education. In all the other school desegregation cases involving 14 different federal and state judges, only Waitis Waring had concluded that public school segregation, even if the facilities were equal, violated the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down unanimously its landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education. The court explicitly cast aside the separate but equal doctrine and adopted the per se rule that all government mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional, first advanced by Judge Waring in his Briggs dissent. Among the other actions in Brown was the reversal of the majority opinion in Briggs v. Elliott. Judge Waring was always philosophical about what he called the unpleasant repercussions of his civil rights decisions. In an oral history late in life, Waring observed, taking the whole thing in balance, I think I'm enormously fortunate because you don't often in life have the opportunity to do something you really think is good. I think a great stroke of fortune came down my alley. The other penalties don't amount to anything. They're offset by what I think is a really important contribution to the history of our country. A little over a year ago, as I completed Unexampled Courage, I visited the town of Batesburg and retraced the fateful path of Isaac Woodard from the bus stop where he was removed from the Greyhound bus and arrested to the storefront and around, around the corner where he was beaten and blinded and to the location up the street where the town jail and court once stood. Joining me on this solemn walk was, a, was the mayor of Batesburg and the town attorney, both of whom had only recently learned of the Woodard beating and blinding from me. On June 1, 2018, the town attorney filed a motion to reopen the case of the town of Batesburg versus Isaac Woodard to overturn his criminal conviction. That motion was granted expunging the Woodard conviction. And several months ago, the town of Batesburg dedicated a historic marker candidly telling the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. Members of Sergeant Woodard's family traveled from New York for the ceremony, and the mayor publicly apologized on behalf of the town for the tragic events of that fateful evening, February 12, 1946. Unexampled courage is a story that deserves to be told with all of its pathos, its brutality, and its redemption of the American system of justice. Thank you very much. And I would be glad to, to answer any questions anyone might have. Yes, sir. Thank you for bringing this history to us and the importance of it. Can you talk about any discussions that occurred from the words of Sergeant Woodard he did not receive justice in his time, but did he have anything that what was occurring from what he experienced come out of that that he came to peace with, if there was any statements that he made? Well, it, that's, a, that's a good question. And let me, let me trace a little bit about what happened to Sergeant Woodard, which is, um, which is an important part of this story. Um, Sergeant Woodard, I mentioned, had been released from the Army about five hours before he was beaten and blinded. And um, when he was, um, he was taken to a VA hospital and um, he was irreversibly blinded. And he was, they, they, the staff there was to, uh, to um, um, apply for disability for him. But because he had already been discharged from the Army, he was not eligible for full disability benefits. Seems crazy today, but that was the story, even though he was still in uniform. So when he was discharged, he went to his parents' home. They had moved, like many African-Americans from South Carolina in the Great Migration. They had moved to the Bronx, 
and he joined them there and was basically dependent on his parents. Um, he was 26 years old, blinded. Um, he, um, he did uh, acquire some um, um, training as a blind person, and he um, um, uh, operated for a while a, um, a newsstand, as we know some blind people will do, a local newsstand in New York City. And um, he struggled. There's no question about it. Uh, there was a period uh, where this became, uh, he, he was a living uh, a survivor of, of Jim Crow, of, of racial violence. And for a time, he did travel. NAACP um, had a speaking tour, and he did earn some money doing that. Um, and um, also that concert with Joe Lewis raised enough money, they bought him a house. They had enough money, they raised to buy him a house. In 1961, Congress changed the law and said until the soldier arrives home, uh, he is a member of the service. And, and, um, uh, and Isaac Woodard thereafter had full disability benefits. He bought a, he had a, a, a um, uh, he later would buy a VA home uh, he took some of the money he had accumulated and, and earned, and he um, became a landlord. He rented properties. He had his nephew, who I've come to know very well, would go collect the rent for him. And he lived a sort of middle-class life. Now, that's the financial end of it. Um, the family tells me that initially he was very bitter, understandably very bitter. And at some point, he just told his family, I can't live with this hate. I've got to let it go. And they remembered him thereafter as a very jovial and uh, spirited person. There was an interview, um, I got these records from the VA, of, of a social worker interviewing him in 1964, and he was described as very pleasant until she asked him what happened. And she said it was a source of tremendous personal pain to talk about it. So, um, and here's the really, you know, among the tragedies of this story, he never knew his impact on President Truman and Judge Waring. He never knew that he had inspired both of them to act, and out of that came the desegregation of the military in Brown versus Board of Education. A remarkable legacy, but he never knew that. I will tell you that the family has taken enormous pride in this. Um, uh, I had a talk in New York where, I don't know, 30 or 40 Woodard uh, family members uh, came to the Brooklyn Historical Society, and when the town of Batesburg um, erected the monument and um, did the public apology. I, I'd say about 15 to 20 Woodard relatives traveled from New York. So the family has uh, gathered some peace, but um, uh, unfortunately, Sergeant Woodard never knew this story. Yes, sir. Judge Gergel, my name is Cliff Zatz, and I'm a uh, member of the Duke Law School class of 1979. Well, you and I graduated <laughs> together. We sure did. It's wonderful to see you again. We, yeah, good to see you. We, we had darker hair then. We did, both of us. <laughs> uh, I was struck as I read about the way that Judge Waring engineered Briggs versus Elliott. Um, today, I think we would hear uh, demands for recusal, cries of judicial activism. Uh, here is a federal judge calling the attorney for one side into Summoning chambers. Summoning him into his office, ex parte communication. Ex parte communication, telling him what lawsuit to bring, and indeed telling him beforehand, here is how I, ru I will rule. Uh, did you find any evidence that he had any qualms or hesitation about this, and do you think that sort of thing could happen? Again well, today. first of all, the standards for judicial ethics in, uh, in, um, in 1951 are very different today. Uh, nobody would ever get back into my chambers one side. That would never happen. And that has tended to evolve in a more rigid way than existed in 1951. I don't think there's any question, though, that this is very aggressive on his part. And... Um, uh, but there were efforts to try to d disqualify him, not from Briggs. There were no motions about disqualification in the Briggs case, but in his voting rights decisions, he had given some public speeches denouncing the efforts to prevent African Americans from voting. And that was, uh, he denied their motions for recusal, and, it, and uh, his, decisions, uh, his decision was affirmed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal. It was fully aired. And the uh, Fourth Circuit, there's a whole story, very interesting story about the Fourth Circuit's support of Judge Waring through many of these decisions. And the, and the court ruled, John J. Parker writing for the court, who was the chief judge, there's a whole story about, I'd be glad to talk about Judge Parker, but he wrote, he says, having zeal 
for the Constitution is not a basis to be disqualified. I, I, I do mention in the book that um, he would have been far better served not to have had that discussion with Marshall. And there are ways to do it. We all judges know my, my dear friend and colleague, Judge Child, Michelle Childs is with me here today. We know that if we think some issue needs to be addressed, sometimes the lawyers don't raise an issue that really needs to be a threshold issue or something that needs to be addressed. You can do that publicly. You don't need to summon them back to your office to do it. So he's a little ham-handed about that. And I said at one point in the book, I said, you know, he didn't pitch a perfect game, but he, he, but he, but he pitched a masterpiece. So he didn't quite get that part right. And he's like blazing a path here that no one had ever gone. That is the judge. You're talking about activists. These civil rights judges, and there would be others, Frank Johnson, mm -hmm. Judge Wisdom, Tuttle on the Fifth Circuit. There'd be other J. Skelly Wright in New Orleans that would come later. But in 1948, there was nobody but Waitis Waring. So he didn't get it all right, but um, he certainly set a model that I think all of us can admire, and particularly his courage. Thank you for the question. Yes, any other, any other questions? Uh, I very much enjoyed your book. Thank you. I've been a civil rights lawyer for 50 years, and mostly with the federal government. Um, did the, did the federal government play any role? I know that they participated in Brown, but prior to that, other than the effort to pr prosecute the case, did they play any role in the school, school cases at that time? They, they really didn't. The Justice Department, um, and if you were, were you in the Civil Rights Division? That's correct. Okay, I mean, you know, after Bobby Kennedy and that whole uh, tradition out of the, um, um, uh, Department of Justice, you know, the brightest lawyers in America, and I imagine you were among those. That was the hardest job to get in America was to come out of a law school and get a job in the Civil Rights Division. It became a really honored position and an honored tradition. That was not true in 1946. And I detail, and as you know, in some de and I, I do detail in, in uh, considerable uh, um, with, with calling out the individuals and the conduct that the prosecution of Linwood Shaw by the Department of Justice was completely incompetent. It was half-hearted. The president could have ordered it, but everybody went through the motions. They did not thoroughly investigate the case. Um, they did not even get the medical record, which would have proven that the um, officer's defense, his defense was, Isaac would have attacked me and I hit him just once. Well, any examination of the medical records and the serious injuries he had and the nature of the injuries one could have disproven that, that, that his account, that they, they took the end of the, of the uh, blackjack and, 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 and pushed it into both eyes was clearly true. And um, I, one part of my, of, uh, of my efforts um, uh, was to, I located the medical records. That was, that was not easy to get. I had the Veterans Administration help me locate those records and I gave them to a renowned forensic pathologist who then reconstructed how the pattern of injury. Uh, so the answer is that, um, but for President Truman um, pushing the prosecution really in response to this meeting, there were very few prosecutions. They were largely unsuccessful. Uh, Judge Waring later in life was asked about the Woodard um, uh, efforts of the Department of Justice. And he says, you know, I really couldn't believe they didn't call critical witnesses. There was uh, you know, from the book, there was like several eyewitnesses who were not, did not actually testify. And he said, but you know, they could have had 20 eyewitnesses and it wouldn't have mattered to that jury. <laughs> you know, it just didn't matter. So, um, but that, that tradition we all think about of this robust, um, highly competent uh, prosecution of uh, civil rights cases was something that really was a 1960s phenomenon. Yeah, I know that before the Civil Rights Division was created in 1957, <clears throat> I think there was a civil rights unit in the criminal division. There was. In fact, the, the, um, there were seven lawyers uh, for the entire country, yeah. and they had 1,500 to 2,000 complaints a year handled by seven lawyers and they depended on the FBI to investigate, and the FBI was notoriously unsympathetic to, uh, to civil rights investigation. So it was a very tough, and 
I, um, a historian who's working on the biography of Bobby Kennedy told me that until the, um, um, the Civil Rights Division got its own investigators, they never really made progress. And that was right. one of the things that, you know, that happened in the 60s. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Well, it's been truly a pleasure. Thank you for joining me here and, and letting me share the story of an example of courage. Thank you. Folks, there is a book signing one level up in the archives bookstore. The books are at the cash registers. We'll see you up there in just a few moments. <laughs>